Good evening, friends. Welcome to Soul Talk Tuesday. I'm so glad to have you all here tonight. This brief time, this series, is an opportunity for us to get together and for me to introduce you to some amazing people in the world that I am blessed to call friends and and colleagues. And um, the nice thing about this unusual time when we're doing so much in this way is that we can reach out beyond the borders of our own cities and bring in easily people who are uh, living in other places. Stretch the web, as I like to say. We are stretching the web um, from here to there and back again. And of course, that web is always there, isn't it? It's not, it's not that we have to make it happen. We're just aware. So tonight, my special guest is a beautiful, amazing, graceful, creative, uh, expressive woman with a deep and profound heart. Her name is Janet Farnsworth. Um, I have known you, Janet. I was trying to remember. I met you at Joss Price's house in Vermont. And you are from Austin and I am from Colorado. So we met each other on the other side of the country yes. in Vermont. And that was five years ago. Sounds possible. Like that. Uh, and uh, like so many people, I tend to run into you and meet up with you in sacred space. Yeah. And so, um, and this too is sacred space, really sacred space. And the people who've joined us today are people looking for, for answers that move their souls. So a few years ago, a year ago, two years ago, you released your book. How long? A year ago, yeah. Ago. And the yeah. book is called Love Your Body, which is exactly, exactly what you teach. That mm -hmm. is exactly what you do. And you do it through lots of different means. And I'm wondering if you could start by telling us a little bit about that. Ah, the book, what I do? Yes. All of it, yes. As you say, we just go right in. Like we're going right there. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, first of all, it's so nice to be here with those of us who are here in the room and then those who will join, I guess, later watching. It's such a pleasure to be in your space, Ariana. I, I feel like um, I'm in a sanctuary. So thank you. Thank you. I feel very honored that I get to be one of your special friends who gets invited to talk. So thank you. And, you know, I, my, my answer to your invitation will be parenthetical because I want to refer to what you said specifically about this space, which is that you explore how to move your soul. Souls who are looking how to move souls. And that, that to me so beautifully embodies exactly what love your body is about which is moving the soul. And we can't move unless we're in our bodies. Now that does not mean that we actually are physically in motion, but as long as we are breathing, we're having experience of this physical mass that we live in, right? Until I always like to talk about, you know, until we're like Harry Potter, and we can throw, you know, the flu powder into the fireplace and then disappear and be someplace else. Our experience of our souls can only be through the experience of this, right? Like this thing here that we feel. And, and so many of us, I would argue that probably every one of us in this call has some part of this that we struggle with, right? Whether or not it is perhaps a physical pain or a condition, or what I think is certainly common is something that looks a certain way or that has the wrong size or the wrong shape or the wrong texture. I mean, I could check my box off on all of those. We, we go to war with it. And when we're at war with it, we lose access to our souls. I mean, it's, to me, it's like that, it's that simple and that profound. 
You quoted some really good statistics in your book, and I was I was looking at them today, and they're a little shocking. Sixty nine percent out of a, a Daily Mail survey of forty five thousand women, sixty nine percent said mm-hmm. they not just dislike but hate the way their body looks. Yeah. Yes. That's, wow. Wow. Yes. And then according to Glamour magazine, 97% of women, and I don't know what their measurement body was. I don't know what the, what the, how many they talked to, how many women they talked to, mm-hmm. but 97% of however many women that, that they spoke with dislike their body. And so just out of curiosity, I went online to get an idea of how that compares to men and their body. And it's really dramatically different. I found 21% of men mm-hmm. in studies between 20 and 30% of men speak about disliking their body. So that's a, a massive difference, massive difference. Mm-hmm. And just to think that 97% of women are unhappy in their body, and this is the only one we have, right. and, and everything we are comes from this form Wow, that's mind boggling. Yes, it is mind boggling. And I have to say, actually, you know, the 97%, the glamour, the glamour survey, which I don't remember the, you know, the, the, the number, but it was substantial enough. Um, certainly the 97% is the highest one. I, I, I would argue that probably 100% of us, if asked right now, what would you change about your body if you could? I think 100% of us, would, something would come to mind. You know, the shape of my ears. How the, how my height, it might not even be something that, you know, we would say it like, you know, that we're ashamed of, but we would change something about ourselves. And, and that, that kind of question, men's numbers are, are pretty high too. I, you know, I am working on my second book right now and I'm doing research about social media and, um, and, you know, the, the most recent, uh, study that I saw said, I'm not gonna remember exactly the numbers, but it was something like 79% of women compare themselves disfavorably to figures they see. Although interestingly, we compare ourselves disfavorably to people that we don't know as well. That when we know somebody better, somehow there's a greater sense of forgiveness for ourselves as a comparison thing, but up to 69% of men do. Wow. So um, it's pervasive. Yeah. So. So Janet, you, you have told me a little bit of your personal story. It's really relevant to why you got started on this path anyway. You know, how it is that you ended up doing what you do each day. And, and uh, this is not just a great, gosh, this is a great career field. This yeah. is very personal to you. I wonder if you would be willing to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's funny, I haven't spoken about it directly in a while, so I appreciate the invitation, but I have to kind of shift my, my mind for a moment. Um, I was assaulted when I was three years old, and it was a family member, and it was one time, and it was enough. It was enough to know that my body was not a good place to be, And I pretty much consistently spent the next, oh, 37 years or so staying as far outside of it as I possibly could. I didn't know I was doing it. In fact, I, you know, I grew up, my experience of my external shell was, I was tall and thin and blonde and living in New York City and people are saying, oh, you look right. And so I was supposed to be happy with how I looked and somehow that was my relationship with my body. But the reality was, was I barely felt anything. And uh, I felt a deep sense of shame and discomfort with, uh, with me. Even when I was, you know, taking modeling pictures, it had nothing to do with what my internal state was. My internal state was pretty much disconnected and dissociated. And that's like the fancy clinical term, right? I didn't want to be in my body. That's what the reality was. And as a consequence of that, I didn't really know what I liked to do. 
didn't really know what I liked to eat, didn't really know what I liked to wear, didn't really know the kind of life I wanted to live because I wasn't connected. It kind of was like, you know, I'm just doing all the things I'm supposed to be doing and the world says do that, okay, and, and then she says do that, okay, and then that looks sort of interesting, so maybe I'll go over there, but there was no sense of myself. And, but I thought I was happy in many ways, you know, I mean, I had, a, I had what I felt was a great partnership, marriage, I, I gave birth to beautiful children. And then the moment came when my youngest child went to kindergarten. And for the first time in my life, I wasn't navigating, you know, family and crisis or school or work, I suddenly had this freedom. And I was kind of a what now? I think I, I do. I talk about this in my book. I watched a lot of The Dog Whisperer for a couple of months. <laughs> it's like, I was like, that just would cry. Caesar just touched me, you know. But I, I started, to, um, I started to, to do community theater because I knew I'd like to do that as a kid. And I think I was in cabaret. And I don't think I had a, I, I didn't have a name to my character, but it was fun. And I started to, you know, move to the music and and as a consequence of that started to move because it just felt good and it was in the movement that I remembered I had a body and when I remembered I had a body and I connected to it I connected to me and for the first time in my life at 40 years old I went oh my god I'm here like, whoa. And I had to deal with feelings and memories and uh, thoughts and that weren't always comfortable or fun. And in doing that, I, uh, I discovered, oh, this is what I like to eat. This is what I want to wear. These are the people I want to talk to. This is the life that I actually want to live. And, you know, it's interesting today, I had a, a session with a beautiful young woman who knows my story and who said, well, does that mean that I have to leave everything to become myself? And it's like, no, 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 no. It's about, it's about becoming yourself, period, you know. Um, and I was only able to do that by moving and, and feeling this thing, you know, this, this thing that had been so <laughs> shamed and blamed and told to look a certain way and like there was no sense of what I was. So what I'm, what I hear and, and certainly this aligns with an experience I've had for myself is there's a difference between knowing you have a body, mm. feeling yourself yeah. in your body. Like the, the, the idea of the tactile sense you know, like you can feel that it's chilly outside and not feel what it is to be cold, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's utilitarian, oh, it's chilly, I'd better get a coat, which yeah. is very different than to stand in a chilly breeze and notice the goosebumps that rise on your body or the, the way the wind blows and what it feels like as your hair moves in the wind, right? Those are different yes. kinds of things yes so yeah. tell us that tell us about that oh so it's interesting that you talk about that specifically about the difference between being in the cold and knowing that it's chilly versus feeling that it's chilly and oh there god there's so much to say about that because part of what i teach is actually literally the experience of how to ground into your sensate as as a as an act of safety that, you know, we know if you've read, you know, you've heard about the book, I can't remember the name of it now properly, but like the tiger in the room, right? You know, the nervous system does not know that there's no danger. The nervous system can only know that we're safe by actually grounding into the physical, seeing the color of the table in front of you, feeling the texture of, you know, your, your pant leg underneath your hand, that there is actually something profoundly somatically soothing in the body to be able to 
be right where you are. So, okay, wait a second. Oh, I feel the cold air on my skin. I know, I know that I'm right here. Because for most of us, most of the time being right here, like in the place that you are sitting in right now, like on that chair, on the sofa, on the bed, wherever you are, like actually where you are, the physical present is there actually is no physical danger, right? So that when you actually come into like the ordinary physical experience of where you are right now, you have already like you, 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 you reset a, a parasympathetic nervous response, which is, no, actually, the wall is not. I mean, I'm not. I'm not trying to be cute. I mean, it's like you literally have to know. The panic response is no, no. The wall is not falling. I'm okay, because the likelihood is being outside of the body, right, has been some kind of protective measure, and so, and so to do the opposite thing might be counterintuitive. You might think, no, 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 no. I don't want to actually be in my body. But when you start to do that, you actually. You, you, you neurologically reset yourself to, to know that everything is okay in this freaking moment. And I swear, but out of respect to your group, I won't because it's not what I, word I wanted to say. <laughs> it's, like, it's like in this freaking moment, I am not dying. In this moment, I can breathe. Nobody is suffocating me. Nobody is actually doing something to me. Hopefully, I mean, you know, most of the time when we do this practice, obviously, right? And so, yes, there is literally that act of like, oh my God, okay. Like I can feel like I'm sitting with you right now and I'm, I'm warm because I'm talking to you, but my fingertips are a little bit cold because there was some air conditioning blowing. That the more I, the more I can be here and that you can be where you are, the more that we can know that we're safe. And the more that we know that we're going to be safe, we can actually start to experience ourselves comfortably. There's another piece here, though, if I may, yeah. <laughs> which is the art of feeling. That there is something profoundly different, as I was mentored and is also in my book. The, the being feeling and feeling feeling. Like when I am crying hysterically, as I used to often, before I connected to my body or would scream and yell, I had a perception that that meant I was feeling a lot. Right? So when, you, when you're crying, do you think that you're sad? Oh, I'm, I'm sad. Well, there's a difference between that's being sad. Right? But actually, if I can hold space and witness, allow and welcome, and this is like this to me as a practice, what is moving through me, that's actually the art of feeling. And, you know, some of you who are listening have heard me tell this story, but a, a revolutionary moment for me was in, you know, that, that moment after I arrived in my body, I was working with my mentor and my therapist and earth mother, and I uh, had the opportunity actually to, to interact with the, my perpetrator. And I thought I should. And uh, because of circumstance and years had gone by. And, um, and when I was talking about it, I was getting very agitated. And I was getting extremely upset. And I think I scheduled an emergency session with her. And, uh, and I think I was probably, I was like, I was like, I was raising my voice and I'm getting really upset and I don't know, and I'm fast. And she said, whoa, whoa, she said, Janet. She said, can you slow down and start to feel? And I was like, what do you mean? I'm like, I, I, can't, I can't stop feeling, I'm ah! And she said, no, wait, 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 wait. She said, I want you to sit back. This moment changed my life, by the way. She said, sit back, close your eyes. And can you make some space? And it literally was putting my arms around the experience of myself and then stepping far enough back to witness and watch the torrent of feeling that was moving through me. The first thing that rose for me was rage. <clears throat> and the image that came vividly was a burning volcano, like this erupting volcano, fire. But I just sat there and I held it. And I was present with it for as long as it needed to burn. I wasn't yelling. 
I wasn't breaking anything. I was, I, the true self, right? I was allowing the dynamic nature of my soul, which is my feeling, to move through me. I'm just, wow, man, I am furious. I feel enraged. And let it burn as long as it needs to. That, to me, is actually feeling. You know, which is exactly what I had never done because all I knew was how to be it and then to be overwhelmed by it. Mm -hmm. I often um, think of myself as, uh, and you've had children, so you'll appreciate this. Those of you who've had kids will appreciate this. Um, Even if it's a niece or nephew, when children begin to walk, they, they walk with their head is bigger when they're little. Their head is bigger than the rest of their body. It's just the way children are built at about one year old. And they walk at an angle with their head forward until they learn to hold their head back up, right? Mm-hmm. So the head carries them forward and they eventually they go over, you know, because they're trying to figure out what do I do with this thing? And, and I often think about that as my, I'm in my own way of getting out of my body. Mm. Sometimes I feel like I'm just leading so far with my head that the rest of my body is running behind trying to catch up and can't feel a dang thing. You know, it's just in motion trying to keep up with my head, which is actually a really great strategy for staying out of your body. Mm -hmm. Right. And in the times that I, the, the times I feel the most embodied are times that I spend several days out in nature in silence where I don't have to talk to anyone. Mm -hmm. Like I can just, there's not all this stuff I have to process. And so when I come out of that, I feel like I have my head back over my shoulders. Mm -hmm. Like the system has settled and I, I feel back in my body. I have a really hard time staying there. Did you? that well I, I, can I ask you a question of course so when when you have that experience of going out in nature and feeling like reset does that does that feel like what what about that is different for you and I don't have to talk to anyone I don't owe anybody anything I'm not trying to meet anybody's needs or um, or consider, I, I actually get to be with me, <laughs> which doesn't happen very often. Most of my life is being with everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. It's interesting that, you know, you share that because I recently just came back from Colorado <laughs> where I had sequestered myself to work on my second book. And, um, and I became acutely aware that any interaction, including my very well-meaning neighbors, like in the unit next door, was such a pull outside of my capacity just to be present with myself. That somehow, you know, I think that we get so trained, at least I know I have been so trained, that when I'm talking with other people or interacting with other people, it's like this pull, it's like a hook out of myself. You know, it's like, let me look at you. And in fact, you know, when I used to do very deliberate conscious movement and dance workshops, my first instruction would be, don't close your eyes, but don't look at each other. Because as soon as you lift your gaze to somebody's eyes, it's like this coming out and you've left your experience of yourself. You know, it's either, ooh, I like your pants, or, you know, it's feeling the need to smile or engage, you know? And, um, and, and what, you know, which is uh, to me is like sort of the second step, like if we have to practice like becoming and allowing like, what is this like in here, right? Like, how can I allow this to move? How can I allow this to feel and be just as it is, is the practice, right? Like, so for you, you go into nature or we, you know, there's a meditation perhaps, or, you know, or you do my practice or whatever, but that you do that connection 
And then like what gets really juicy is how do we do that? Like how do you stay connected when you come back from nature and do that with somebody else? Good question, Janet. How do you do that? <laughs> I'm still working on That's chapter five of my book. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the dad divine download. To figure out. I don't know. How do we do that? Um, I, you know, it, right. Good question. And because you asked, I'll answer in the messy way that I can. One thing that is not hard for me is to talk. Um, ironically, I suppose. But um, I really think that it has so much to do with practicing being the self. You know, it's, it's, we know this, you know, Joe Dispenza's book, we understand so much now about the neuroplasticity of the brain that we, we understand so much better now that experience creates patterns of the mind. And what the mind knows is familiar, the mind will go to, right? That brilliant uh, insight of Dispenza's, which are the, the clarification, right? Your brain is wired to keep you alive. And when you wake up in the morning and you're alive, your brain says, great, let's do exactly the same thing today so we don't die, right? And so, you know, so it's like, okay. And so you do it over and over again and your brain says that must be important, you know? And, and so, by the way, similarly, it's why it can be so hard to create new neural networks because your brain is fighting you every step of the way. Like, no, 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 you could die. You could die if you do that new thing. And like, thank you, brain. But like, sometimes we got to counteract like what it's thinking for us and what it's saying. No, 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 don't. Here, here's the fear response. You know, it's like, ah, no, actually, I decided that I am not going to pick that same kind of partner anymore. I'm going to do it this way, you know, or whatever the new thing is. But you do that more and more. And by the way, we also know that the more you do that with passion, the more you actually have the, uh, the, um, the, the hormonal and the neurochemical response of, oh, this is important, the faster the brain will download it and be like, okay, this actually we need to retain as information. And so I don't know ultimately, although I, I probably could hypothesize more about how to do that with another. I mean, that's actually a deeply what, you know, so the West has, has commandeered from the Tantra practice, right? Is how to be with the self with another and has, has turned it into a sexualized practice and it's not meant to be. Um, but I think that we can't get there until we know what it is to be ourselves, right? To, uh, right, right. Just to keep feel, practicing. Yeah, mm. to feel ourselves in the body, right? So, yeah. So then, so it brings up a couple of things for me. One is that I, I think we're conditioned from very young that our job is to, our, our safety relies upon, and our job initially in the early ages is to do what makes our parents happy and that can be whatever it is you know oh let's dance honey okay that makes mom happy i'm gonna dance right but it's not feeling in your body it's a totally different thing when a child dances on their own or when they're dancing because they're getting the attention right yes oh yes and i get for you to, yes you just got me very excited there because right before <laughs> I was just saying, I want to like ask everybody, like, hey, everybody who's on the call, like, how are you doing? Like, talk to me. But dad just totally hooked me in. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess got to say one thing about that. Because it ain't just dancing that we're being asked to do. Every time we say, finish your plate. Every time you say, go to the bathroom before we get in the car. Every time you say, put out your hand and say, how do you do? Or, heaven forbid, go give Aunt Bertha a kiss. You know, we are, it's like, I see one of you, yeah, no, but okay. And so you might know inside, like, no, and that's a hard thing to maintain, right? I mean, like we get lots of pressure to do all these things time and time and time again, these macro and micro aggressions against our instinct, because really that's what, you know, that's what the practice of connection is, is we're, we're connecting to the instinctive, the intuition, the, the knowledge, the seeing within right? But then when we're told, no, 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 it's time to go to the bathroom, you know? I mean, and, and obviously some of it is functional. I mean, we potty train for a reason. We learn how to be social and circumstances for a reason. And I mean, 
I, 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 I think kindness is, is functional, right? And, you know, by definition of being human, we don't get to actually stay with the feeling of ourselves, right? It's like, it just doesn't get to happen. Well, and we learned that our job is to make the people around us happy by our performance, by what it is that we do. So right. the thing that we learn is, is meaningful mm -hmm. is how we relate to the people outside and around us in service to them. Yes, right, right, exactly. True for everybody. I, I have to be careful that I don't mask the whole world in what is true for me, because that's not always true. I mean, some of us are very clear about what is important to me versus what is important to you. Yes. You know, I certainly work in one of those caretaker fields where my job is driven by what the needs of other people are. So, mm. so finding that way, again, of stepping back and creating time to ask yourself what you enjoy doing. Am I doing it? <laughs> you know, am I knowing I enjoy it and making time to do it is different. Um, you, you touched just briefly on, on instinct and intuition. And what I, what I had been thinking mm. about while you were talking earlier is the wisdom of the body, the wisdom that isn't what's here. And I know that you have shared conversation with me about that before and about your own discovery of that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, I, I, I weep with gratitude for your bringing in even the phrase, the wisdom of the body. You know, some of it, again, is so ordinary and so obvious, and yet we forget we forget that at this moment, you have 72 trillion cells that are working in tandem to keep you well. 72 trillion little universes inside the organ of your skin and in your bones and in your body that are working exclusively for your wellness. It's mind-boggling. And those cells organize into systems, respiratory, circulatory, reproductive systems that are all working for you. Even the day before you die, there is more working right in your body than wrong. If that by itself is not enough wisdom to bring you to your knees in reference. I don't know what is. And there's more. There is a conversation happening between that, inst that instinctive, right? The, the um, oh, it's funny, I'm completely blanking on the, the scientific word for it, but the involuntary systems in your body, even when you're sick, even when you could be, are about to die, that want you to be well. Those actually have systems to communicate with you. And it has to do with, first, your senses. You learn what is not good by touch and hurt and pain. That is your intelligence telling you, don't do that again. Don't put your finger in the fire. That's your wisdom. That has, that's not me. I can't put that into your somatic, your physical intelligence. Similarly, taste, right? Your taste, your nose has an evolutionary intelligence. You can smell as something's rotten. That's your body saying, don't eat it. In the eyes, also, like you see, you see the, the, the waves of flame and get heat, right? Part of how you interact with your wellness is actually through the eyes, which is part of why, you know, they're so powerful in our definition of life. Separate conversation. But you have all of these biological drives as a, as a rudimentary matter that are saying, let me take care of you. But that's not all. There's more. There's more. You have something called emotion. 
It's not just your physical, I mean, it makes me want to weep. It's not just your physical sensation that's telling you what's true. It's your emotional sensation. It's the intelligence of your anger. That's your boundary. It's the intelligence of your grief saying, this is what I value, and if I lose it, I'm sad. It's the intelligence of your joy saying, this feeds me. This makes me more alive. There are layers and layers and vast universes of genius that are uniquely yours, that are talking to you at every moment, even in your sleep. We could talk about the reticular activating system and the magic of the brain in your dream state. I mean, the extraordinary poetry it creates for you to interact with yourself in your dreams. Every moment, every breath you take, there is a miracle happening. I mean, the breath itself, let's talk about that. Where does that come from, right? I mean, that's like, that's a core yoga principle. It's a core principle in how many healing modalities. You can't stop yourself from breathing. Try it. Try holding your breath. And, I mean, yes, some of us can make ourselves pass out. There's perhaps some of us who can do that, but your body ain't going to let you go. Your body will bring that breath back every day time. How's that for a miracle? There is so much magic happening in your body. And that's your, that's your way back home. That's your way back home to what I would say Interestingly, the word that comes to me, maybe it's because I'm in this group, is that's what brings you back home to God. All right. And, and you said something earlier, early on, about uh, safety, which I, I just love because I have had my own experiences as a young child and I don't experience my body as a safe place to be, yeah. you know. It, like mm -hmm. I said, I'm up here most of the time. Yeah. So listening to you talk about experiencing the body as safe, which is to be able to check in in this present moment yeah. and make sure that you know where you are and you can look around and go, yep, the walls aren't falling in. There's mm -hmm. nothing coming through the doors at me. In this space right now, in this place, I'm safe. This is an incredible thing for us right now in the circumstances we're living in, right? Yes. Oh. In, a, in a safe place, mm -hmm. which is difficult to do if we're thinking forward because we have no idea what's going to happen or how long we're going to be in this kind of chaos we're in. And it's difficult to do if we look backward because when we look backward, we're, we find ourselves looking for something we no longer have. Right. It's interesting. I, I heard someone say lately, uh, just here recently, that um, being in lockdown when we were in the COVID lockdown was actually much more comforting for people than coming into safer at home because you could be in your home and be safe. Like it was your home. Even though the world outside was crazy, it was there's something comforting about your home. And then safer at, safer at home meant we were actually beginning to go out in the world, which is not as safe. It occurs to me as you're talking that, that if you establish yourself in your body and it feels safer to be in your body, then home is traveling with you. Yeah. Beautiful. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, on that note, it's, you know, it's interesting you talk about going into the future or going into the past. One, I heard this wonderful expression that it's, you know, it's the, um, it's the price of rehearsing or rehashing. Mm. You know, it's either, you're either rehearsing what's to come or you're rehashing where you've been and you completely lose being in the moment. And, you know, one of the things that I teach is the exquisite irony of the safety of being now. That 
when you know when you have an experience of discomfort in the body or being present the mind wants to say and keep you outside of this because you have a good reason right you have a good reason to not want to be in your body because you had an experience of it being unsafe and so the mind works to keep you out of it right you daydream you shop you eat you drink whatever it is like just keep me out of this because i know i know up here it's not a good place to be but actually if you can take that deep breath and then take a look around okay i'm wearing pink sweatpants i see this many boxes on the screen with little red dots you know and and i come you come into where you are physically here now as we said you know you can see okay there's no one actually with a knife in the room no one is actually standing over me about to hurt me and and you start to be able to be present with the what is which is the witness i you actually get to okay if i am here in this room what else is present oh i can actually feel my heartbeat i can now be aware that as i feel my heartbeat mm, i'm a little thirsty oh, i'm a little thirsty i'm also aware that oh i'm thinking about the people whose faces i see and don't see and i'm wondering how people are doing and oh i'm wondering how people how people are doing oh i can feel a part of me that's nervous oh i can feel a part of me that's feeling loving and so the moment gets bigger and bigger and bigger until actually i have started to cultivate a capacity to be so present that i realize that this is all that actually exists and that in this moment i can access it all and when i can access it all i can create the reality that i want to create i can say oh hello nervous part self these are good people it's okay you're all right oh look at ariana's beautiful face smiling and nodding but i like i become much more adept at the moment and so yes i take this moment wherever i go because we're doing it anyway <laughs> like as much as we would like to think that we can live till we can live two days ahead or i can live and plan how the next thing is going to go bad news we can't <laughs> you know all that we can actually do is interact with right now and with ourselves the more that we can be present with ourselves and be interested because right here in this moment we've got memories and family patterns and epigenetics understanding that i've also got my past in the present like i my family is genetic but the more i can actually be present then i get to actually make the moment i want it to be and i can figure out ooh how do i want to be cozy how do i want to feel okay that's like that's good that's that's making a home right that's like the nest that i know i want to live in you know even as i do by the way travel between airbnbs <laughs> because i am completely mobile right now you know it's like oh okay and though like where are where am i oh i'm right here okay let me make this moment and make just this one so all i got how do i need to be okay nice yes yeah jenna you um you talked about being in new york and being and i you know people are only seeing you from here up you are a stunning woman you are a, you are a physically stunning woman and and that is mm. um, i i believe women come into their fullness at about 40 and mm. uh, we think women are studying stunning in their 20s and they haven't hit it yet they they haven't there's mm -hmm. something else that happens um mm -hmm. but as as you get older there are changes that you see as you have children your body looks different as you um 
as you find yourself in different work environments, you, you know, if you're waitressing, you're getting lots of movement. If you're behind a desk, suddenly you're not. And yeah. so there's a lot of switching and changing. And when, when we look at the color, the cover of your book, you have women of many, of many sizes uh, in their skivvies on yeah. the cover of your book. It's a luscious, rich, full-bodied, literally full-bodied picture. And, um, and I wonder as people meet you as a teacher, if they look and go, yeah, but Janet, look at you. You can mm -hmm. imagine what it feels like to be in this body. I wonder yeah. how you, like, how do you respond to that? And, and, and tell us a little bit about that. Oh, thank you. And, you know, I'm sorry that I didn't get to hear Sapphire's talk last week because there's so many layers to, 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 to respond to that. And I feel like the first most important one is to unapologetically and clearly acknowledge that the world does treat me differently because I am white, blonde, and have been thin in my life. And it would be, it would be, um, it would not only be foolish, it would be unkind to anyone who has a different skin color, a different shape, to not acknowledge that we are still very confused about interacting with people based on appearance. <clears throat> with that said, when I was 108 and 5'8 and had modeling pictures in my portfolio, I was completely unhappy. And that was that's simply a fact. I recently had the experience of <clears throat> beginning to work with a woman who, if you looked at her, she's actually an Instagram influencer with 100,000 followers. And she is plagued because her stomach is too big. Torture. Can't, can't even enjoy. She can't walk by a mirror without being unhappy. She's doing great, by the way, now. What the external looks like has nothing to do with what the internal experience is. And similarly, it's why I have those beautiful women on my book and on my Facebook page. I have even more the, the range of thin to full bodied. This is all the trick of the mind that wants to make what we look like be the description of what we feel. And, <clears throat> you know, you, you, you talk about the aging process. And it's funny, actually, just this morning in bed, I was lying and I, and I periodically do post some things. I'm like, no, no, I mean, I won't do it now, but I, you know, I'll say, look, look at my crappy belly. Look at my, look at my rolly fleshies and look, I jiggle, you know? <laughs> it's like, look, look, look. at, And like, hello, yay, you know? And I still woke up this morning, I was like, wow, I can like separate the flesh from where I, you know, like it's, it's much looser than it's ever been. Like, wow, I was kind of fascinated and, and, and still walking myself off the ledge of, oh no, my youth is going away, you know. I mean, it's a constant struggle, whoever we are, right? 97% surveyed don't like something about their bodies. 97%. I submit 100% would change something if you could. Just something, right? We are caught in the web. Speaking of like broadening that web, that what we look like has anything to do with what we feel. How, where does that even compute? What does that have to do with this inside? Right? It, it, well, and it doesn't. It doesn't. My mother is 81 this year. And I bet I have heard her say 20 times since her birthday, I don't feel 81. It feels really different in here. It doesn't feel, I have all these wrinkles, but... Mm feel like I should have them yeah so there's a real kind of uh, um, something about that right that those two things don't necessarily jive so somewhere you have to choose which one of those parts of you you want to listen to yes yes and you know I, I, sorry to talk about my book but in my book chapter eight is actually about the third eye 
and the actual seeing, you know, that we are so conditioned. And I think we just mentioned earlier a bit about, you know, the evolutionary mind and the, the, the necessity of sight as a way to interact with safety. Like what we see has a tremendous impact of how we interact with the world. And, and, and we, we, we've gotten attached to it. We've gotten very attached to evaluating our place in the world by what we perceive with our seeing eyes rather than the eye within, which I would also call your connection to your instinct, you know, the, the, the deep knowing of your own being, which is the only truth that any of us can ever know. I can't know your truth, Ariana. I can't know the truth of any of this beautiful group here, but you can know yours. I can only know mine. And the only way I'm gonna know it is not by looking to you. How can I know what I experience within by looking at you? Or even looking at myself out in the mirror and saying somehow that that, 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 that image that I see is an experience of what is within. I love that you mention mirrors because they are the bane of existence as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yes. So when I go camping, I don't have a mirror with me. Yeah. I think some of the times that I feel the most beautiful in my life are the times that I'm camping and I have no mirror and I have no makeup and I have you know, whatever I have on and I'm sweaty and, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, we see it in our kids, right? You, like you take your kids camping and they're sweaty, dirty little kids and they have that sweaty, smelly, you know, sweet little mm-hmm. kid smell, yes, yes. but we miss it in ourselves. Like uh, there's a humanness to meeting someone who is engaged in being alive and it isn't reflective. Right. Right. Like, yes, yes. Like if you think about not like physically pretty or handsome or like people that have turned you on, right? And, and sexually or not, but someone that enlivens and excites you. Like what are the qualities of that person? Like what, what turns you on? What, it, what, what feels good to be around? Mm-hmm. Does it feel good to be around somebody who happens to have a 26 inch waist? Does that actually make you feel good? Doesn't make me feel good. I mean, it just trips up my brain going, well, I don't have a 26 waist. I, I, what, you know, what, 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 this, this is the head game. It's the head. It's like, there, there goes the head. Woo. <laughs> you know? well, how does it feel? How does it feel? Like, who do you want to be with? Like, you know, mm. who do you want to stand with and get on the boat with and, you know, go on the walk with in terms of your feeling self. Somebody who's laughing. Ah, yes. Yes. Robust laugh. Like they yeah. are alive laughing, not just tee hee hee dee, you know, but oh, their yeah. laugh comes through their whole body. Yes. Oh, I feel that in my belly when you say that. I love yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Right? And that to me be a question for anybody, like all of us here listening. Like, who, who, what, who do you want to be with? What's the quality of that person? How does he or she or they make you feel? Yeah. Not how they look. Janet, I have a feeling you and I could talk. I, I'm looking at the clock and realizing we are almost through an hour and I don't even, I have 12 other things I could talk to you about. So we might have to come back and do this again Ooh. when the second book goes out. But I want to make sure that we wrap up here with an opportunity for you to tell us a little bit about how we can take advantage of some of the cool things that you do, Mm. how we can find your book and all of that. And if you are listening here today live, one of the advantages of showing up at the live class is that when we get done recording, Janet will stay for about 15 minutes and answer some questions and you'll have an opportunity to speak to her directly. So don't go anywhere if you're here live. When we finish the show, we have a a few minutes to go afterwards. In the meantime, for people who are watching and for people who will be watching the recording, tell us there, like you have online classes and we can read your book and Mm. how do we 
keep up with Janet Farnsworth the Amazing? Oh, Janet Farnsworth the Amazing wants to hear from every single one of you. And I should be very sad if at least in this live call, I don't get to hear from some of your beautiful faces. I've also been looking at some great little photos and the images. I don't, it's like, I want to know who's behind the cat. But, um, um, uh, and some of your beautiful live smiling faces. Thank you. Uh, my book is Love Your Body. <laughs> and it is uh, the guide to stop making your body a battleground. But to this beautiful community, I would love to just give you a copy. I would love to be able to send you one. Um, all you have to do is just look up my name, which right now should be on the screen under me. I think that this happens in your recordings. It's yes, just it Janet Farnsworth, F-A-R-N-S-W-O-R-T-H at Yahoo. And, or you could just look up my website. Either one will get you a link to my book and you'll just say, hi, I was on Soul Talk, send me your book. And it will give me such delight to send it to you. Um, I actually have an audio book that I haven't been able to bring myself to listen to officially, but my publishers have given to me. <laughs> so if you'd like that, I'll try to bring myself to send it to you and get past my own ego mind, but I would love to do either one. Um, yeah, and so um, there is that. Let me do that and then we can be in touch that way. I also, for the month of August, I'm doing a donation-based Love Your Body yoga practice. Um, Monday through Thursday is 9.30 Central, uh, so I guess 8.30 Mountain Time. If you'd like to come and we get a little sweaty, uh, it's a physical practice, but at its heart is who the heck cares how you look. It's all about how you feel which is really what yoga is all about. And so that is donation based. And so for August, you know, you come pay a dollar, uh, come for once. You don't even have to put your video on, but just join the, our sweet community of celebrating the body in motion. Um, and uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, and finally, if you don't want my book, but you'd like just to talk with me and I'd love to talk with you, just send that message to Yahoo or by going to my website, you can just contact me that way. It would be lovely to hear from you. Anyone that's part of the Soul Talk community and has the wisdom to be part of Ariana's uh, you know, uh, tribe, I'd be honored to chat. So. And Janet, it is JanetFarnsworth.com. Yep, that's it. Easy, JanetFarnsworth.com, just like it sounds. And um, there's lovely stuff there and you can, they, they can get to your yoga class through that, through your website. Do you know, that's actually really quite, you should, but I'm have it may be a little wonky. If, um, hmm, how can I get that to you right now? That's a really good question. If you just contact me, I will send you a link. Just say, hey, give me the yoga link. And, um, or if you go to Facebook, I'm just on faith. Friend, friend me. Be my friend. Or, I, actually, I'm public, so you can even not friend me and still get the yoga link. Um, you'll just scroll down and you'll see Love Your Body Yoga, and there's a Zoom link. And what I do ask, though, is that, what just FYI for the yoga class, if you sign up, you still don't have to pay, but then Zoom, Zoom link will get sent, and it's just an added measure of, bless you, just an added measure of, um, of privacy for those of you, us who join. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Well, I thank you, my friend. I, um, I am just, uh, like I said, when I started, I started doing this show because it occurred to me that I know so many wonderful people who have so much wisdom that is valuable for where we are in this time of transition. And that I could just call and say, hey, <laughs> come talk to me for an hour. Let me, let me just pick your brain a little bit and pull some of that wisdom out into circulation in the circle that I travel in because it, it will be of service here. Mm -hmm. And I so appreciate you being here with me. Um, it so is, yeah, 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 Janet. Uh, so nice to see you here. And I will be back next Tuesday with Soul Talk Tuesday. And uh, I believe next week's guest will be Amy Gillespie, who uh, reads eyes. She's an iridologist, and she 
reads not eyes like you think. Like a lot of people use the eyes to tell about what's going on in the body. She sees your ancestors in your eyes. Ooh. It's really interesting. So she's going to talk about finding your ancestors in your eyes and what your ancestors have placed in your body to give you messages going forward. So it'll be very cool. So I hope you'll join us next week. Janet, I hope you have a beautiful night. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.